Uh, um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, joining us on this uh, webinar. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this CAMDOC Educational Series, webinar number seven. CAMDOC UK is a charity of Cameroon doctors and dentists in the United Kingdom and Ireland, with its objective being the promotion of good health, well-being in the UK and in Cameroon. As part of its engagement with the community, CAMDOC UK has undertaken a campaign to shed light on various interesting and topical issues. Today, we are going to talk about microaggression in the workplace. I would like to share my screen with you guys. Right, now, our topic today, like I said, is microaggression in the workplace. I am Dr. Kieron Gachu. I'm the past vice president of CAMDOC UK, a consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist at the University Hospitals Birmingham, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, where I'm also the international advisor for Cameroon. I am currently taking an MBA program due to finish this program. Now, I wonder if how many of you would recognize some of these uh, phrases. Given that our topic today is on microaggression, I think it is important we understand the origin of this terminology. Microaggression was coined by Chester M. Pierce, who is an African-American psychiatrist working at Massachusetts General Hospital and a professor at Harvard Medical School. This terminology was coined in the 70s and in subsequent years was expanded upon by Dr. Derard Wing Su. Dr. Derard Wing Su defines microaggression as a brief everyday exchanges that send denigrating messages to certain individuals based on, the, on their uh, group membership. At times, the person making the comments may be otherwise well-intentioned and unaware of the potential impact of their words. For the purpose of today's webinar, we would like to use the definition as originally established by Dr. Pierce as a brief and commonplace indignities that communicates derogatory or negative attitudes, as well as lack of as, as well as lack of uh, towards people of African descent, whether intentional or unintentional. Now we have an excellent panel of three speakers. And as you would see, we have Dr. Nkwaye Pafe, who is going to talk us through some real life examples. Mrs. Rose Humbo, who is going to take us through the mental health implications of microaggression. And Barrister Julius Kafu, who is going to bring us home with presentation on the potential legal implications of microaggression. We will start with Dr. Nkwaye Pafe. Dr. Nkwaye Pafe is a general practitioner with special interest in substance misuse. He works for the Ministry of Defense at the University Hospital of Birmingham. He is passionate about microaggression, particularly microaggression in the workplace. Dr. Pafe, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Theo. Uh, Dr. Ngachi. Uh, let me just share my screen and uh, because we'll play and that's fine. Now we, we are going to talk about microaggression in, in the workplace. Now, as, as uh, Dr. Ngachu said, there's a lot of what I'm going to talk today, you've experienced it in the workplace. Where are you from? 
No, where are you really from? That implies that you're not from here, that you don't belong. You, you don't act, you act differently. It, it means that you don't act the way people would expect you to act as a black person. I don't see color. Some people do say that, which, which means they don't actually see your own heritage and so on. I'm not racist because I have a lot of black friends. You are so smart and articulate. Black people are dangerous. And usually this is a, a nonverbal cue, which means uh, if you, you, people would walk on the street, for example, they meet a, a white woman and she crossed the road holding her purse. That's a nonverbal one, which actually say that they're dangerous. Now we're going to talk about the different type of microaggression. Micro assault are always overt. It's something that we could see. And we also have micro insult as are always very subtle. And it, it is believed that the health inequality, for example, in the UK is probably due to this type of microaggression. Then you have micro invalidation, a common behavior that denies the experience of marginalized people. And as Dr. Ngachu said, is we're going to talk about black people, to, uh, about our community. Then there is another type, which is the environmental one, which most of the time people forget. For example, using posters uh, with, uh, who, who will send negative message. Oh, and so on. Now, the, the first example we're going to talk about was uh, a nurse A who was under investigation. And during his assessment, he was asked by a senior nurse to go and call others so they will assess his handover abilities. He left his note on the table in front of the assessor. On his return, his note, note were nowhere to be seen or found. So nurse A became very anxious while looking for his note, was panicking and sweaty. And only after a few minutes, one of the supervisors removed his note from the bin and placed it on the table. Is that microaggression? How do you respond to that? As you could see in this case, uh, it, the, the, the intent was to harm the person. And the person actually made a complaint about the behavior that complaint was not upheld because the nurse defended herself saying that she was using the trust policy. But as everyone knows, working in the NHS, uh, the trust policy says, if, you, if you're going to discard patient information, they have to be shredded. So he made an appeal on that, which is still ongoing in this case. Now, this is a type of micro assault which are small scale attacks. And as we could see, they could be verbal or non-verbal. In this case, it was non-verbal. It was just an, an action. And the aim is to harm the victim or the target. We could also have slurs, which is actually the type that I, I believe uh, when we would, the uh, barista Julius Cafu would talk about is the type that could, could be actually demonstrate that exist and prosecuted from it. Now, the second example is Nurse B who works in a burned unit. She was called upon by her superior to help with another critical ear patient. Nurse B hand over his patient to another nurse before following the supervisor. On his return, the same superior or supervisor told him he should never have left his duty post. He was asked to write a reflection on this incident. Is that microaggression? What to do? In this case, he actually complied with the, uh, with the manager and then write a complaint about the, the behavior of the manager because he felt he did everything right. And in his complaint, he was asking the manager to actually tell him what he should have done uh, when called upon. As you know, in, the, in a military setting, you can actually say no to your superior. 
Now, microinsult, which this could actually go into the, the, the example we just talked about, are very subtle, but very harmful. It is believed that th the way things are going, uh, mostly in the, the health inequality and how things are going, a lot of microinsult are uh, happening daily. And sometimes we don't even take notice of it. They convey sometimes rudeness and it's a cumulative effect, but they're very, it's very difficult to actually demonstrate it at times. Uh, and then we have micro-invalidation, which actually people will make uh, racial comment. Uh, 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 and then when you act upon, they say you're too sensitive and so try to dismiss your, your own uh, emotion with regards to those slurs that has happened. It's actually, it's also meant to harm the person that is, the, the black person that is there. Uh, the, 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 the third or the last or the fourth one, I beg your pardon, which is environmental uh, type of microaggression. This could be a poster, for example, showing uh, migraine. When they talk about illegal migrants, uh, then they put black people, which means only black people could be uh, illegal migrants. That actually has a negative connotation in that social context. And also, uh, for example, when a role in a film is played by a white person, but masking themselves as black, that's actually a microaggression type. Now, how do we respond? Most of the time we have to let it go because there's so many of them during the day in our workplace. We could respond immediately and that can be risky. But at times that's the best course of action. We could respond later, which uh, in our case, that's what has just happened. We, could sp we should speak up most of the time when these things happen, but we have to pick our own battles. We should always remain calm and take, I would advise people to take a deep breath before they actually talk. Ask the person to repeat what they said or did. Take care of yourself and make sure you're safe. How to deal with it? Deal with your own emotions is the first thing to do because we have our own fears or you could, our own rage and anger. We have to deal with that. Uh, uh, as you people would remember, if in a football field, if somebody tackles another one and you react, you're punished and the other person will be let go, which means you should not react. First, you should get the fact right. You should ask the person to repeat what they just heard without any emotion. Play back, avoid exaggeration, get curious, Ask them to expand on it. What did they mean? Then share your thoughts. It, in, in, I would suggest to use the term microaggression at that time, because that's the way you feel. Uh, in, in summary, uh, as I said, we have four types of microaggression, microassault, microinsult, microinvalidation, and environmental type of microaggression. We should respond to it we should pick our own battle. We should control our emotions. And that is key. We should always stay calm and get the facts right. Play back, then share before sharing our own thoughts. Well, as uh, Dr. Ngachu have said, uh, macroaggression was defined by Chester Pease and by Dr. Sue in 2007. But I would like to emphasize on Dr. Francis Welsing, which actually was trying to define why uh, people was held prejudice, belief, and so on against Black. And her view on it was because of uh, the, the white race were afraid about genetic alienation. And that's why this is happening, because the Black male has the power to alienate all the white men. And it was quite, it's a good reading on her book, what she's trying to define why all this, 
unconscious prejudice and beliefs come from. And for that, thank you very much. Right. Um, thank you, Dr. Mpafe. I think that was an uh, excellent uh, presentation and opening of our topic today on microaggression in the workplace. I would like to welcome Mrs. Rose Humbo. Mrs. Mrs. Humbo is a senior mental health nurse. She is the divisional lead for mental health in, uh, in Buckinghamshire for Oxford, uh, Oxford Health Trust. Rose, thank you for taking this, taking the panel. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Mgacho, and thanks for having me here today. So I'm just going to try and share my slides. Sorry, the computer is taking a bit slow. Okay, I've been asked to talk about the impact that my progression has on our mental health and our mental state. As you've already heard from Dr. Pafe, microaggression is quite subtle, but it can be very harmful. It is targeted at minority group or disadvantage group. You've heard that is verbal, behavioral, or environmental. It is true that is subtle. And it's a shame that racism still is still present in today's society. But racism, you could actually evidence that and it's easy to evidence. But with microaggression, it's something completely different. The word itself or the, the cue is that it's subtle, so it's quite difficult to prove. How do we know that we've experienced microaggression, unlike racism, that is quite overt? I'm just going to throw some random questions so that it should stay with you. Have you ever been in a situation where you have to prove? that you're qualified to do the job that you've been employed? Do you feel that you're being addressed at work by your colleagues differently because of your belief, your gender, your ethnicity, your political views, or your other affiliations? For example, you're Christian. If the answer to any of those is yes, it doesn't mean that you face microaggression, but it means you might have experienced something that might be continuous. Other examples, you already heard some of those from Dr. Pafe, is you're very articulate, your English is very good, which means the assumption is that because you're black or you're not English, it means we don't expect you to speak good English. Your name sounds foreign. Well, certainly an example is myself, surname Hombo, H-O-M-B-O, very straightforward. But I've been called Hombo quite a lot of time. Your hair looks different, so I can't recognize you. Have you ever been in a boardroom or in a meeting, handovers with your colleagues, and each time that you're about to talk, you're told, not to answer the question indirectly, or they ask you a question, and before you could answer, somebody's already answering on your behalf. People who experience microaggression at risk of physical and mental health issues. Now, there are many studies around this. It's quite difficult to pinpoint a study that would actually say microaggression can cause this. But there are studies that says microaggression can lead to some of the following 
mental health related issues. It can lead to depression, it can lead to anxiety, it can lead to suicidal ideations, it can lead to alcohol and substance misuse, it can lead to aggression, other related effects of microaggression. As an employee, it does undermine your safety, it can make you feel undervalued, which therefore means it might prevent people from applying for jobs, from negotiating their salaries, from striving for, for promotion, it can affect your confidence. It can affect your productivity. Therefore, your performance at work could be affected. You can have low morale. It can actually make your self-confidence diminish. And then generally, your self-image as an individual. And as such, once you have some of this effect, it therefore means that your behavior might change and how that is interpreted by yourself as an individual would only be in some of the reaction that you might be going through with your loved ones at home. In other words, aggression might be one of the other area. How do we respond to microaggression? Again, you hear quite, um, Dr. Parfait has said quite a few of that. But what I'm just going to say is, we would hear some of the examples that you've heard already does not constitute microaggression. It's just an awareness for you to think whether it has, there is something that you're perceiving that is different. So how do you respond to this? Okay, the first thing is for us to be able to develop our evidence. Developing evidence means actually look at all the things that you're perceiving as microaggression, does that constitute microaggression? Is it happening to you because of your color? That's the key. So somehow you need to put it in context. Are they doing it to me because I'm black? Are they doing the same thing to anybody around me who is not um, black? So you really need to get that evidence. And how do you respond once you've got the evidence? There's something which I call three wise step. It takes a lot of courage for people to respond for all sort of dis discrimination that they might perceive that has happened to them. It takes a lot of courage, which therefore means psychologically, it can be, it can be quite draining. And once you can find the courage to respond, my suggestion, is that you follow this sort of simple three wise steps that I'm going to describe. The first one is passive aggressive. You can respond proactively. You can respond assertively. There's one thing to remember. Responding to microaggression, the key is so that you can get people's action to change. If you want to, I wouldn't advise passive aggression. I'm sure the, it's, the word passive aggression is exactly what that says on the team, passive aggression. So for example, you've got a colleague who constantly talks over you, who constantly make you feel low or little in a meeting. Rather than you addressing that, what you then tend to do is each time you see the colleague or you're in another face with that colleague, you tend to behave in a way that the colleague cannot interpret what you're doing. So you're not addressing the problem. Proactively, an example of that would be you're in a meeting, you're talking, and a colleague cuts right across you. And you respond immediately to say, I'm talking, please, can I finish? That's a proactive way of responding. Assertively, you allow the colleague to finish, and then you, after they finish, you go back to them and just say, I was talking, and you cut across me. Can I finish now? Those are the three simple ways that I think you can respond to microaggression. Again, why do we have to respond to microaggression? 
if you remember what I just said, the key is we want to change people's behavior. As I said, it is quite subtle, so very difficult to prove. In summary, microaggression at workplace can have severe consequences to our mental state and how we behave with others. To respond to microaggression can be quite challenging. However, just like any situation that we find ourselves, any illness that we find ourselves, doing nothing is not an option. There are ways that you can do something about it because the more you leave it, then the more the problem get bigger. So the advice is use those three step wise approach to respond. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Mrs. Humbo. I think uh, that is a very clear uh, presentation of microaggression in the workplace and uh, how to identify it and how to deal with it. I, we will come to our final uh, speaker, uh, Baristan Kafu, who is going to talk to us about uh, the legal implications of microaggression. Baristan Kafu is a barrister in England and Wales and also a barrister registered in Cameroon. He is an expert in international arbitration and mediation and a member of the Sanctions and Appeals Board for the African Development Bank Group. He is also the Vice Chair and Equalities Officer in the Finance and Legal Branch of the United Union. Baristan Kafu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ngachu, uh, for having me here. Uh, may I just put up my presentation? Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, just to say that uh, microaggression um, is a very tricky area because it is a gray area where the law doesn't particularly deals with it on its own uh, and it is usually very difficult to catch the perpetrators and prosecute them or take them to the tribunal uh, for being racist or for harassing you on the basis of a protected characteristics. I'll come to all of those. The reason being when the offenders, when they're using those hard words, those hostile words, those annoying words, they generally don't say that they're doing that because of your race, because of your religion, because of the color of your skin, because you're a man or a woman, they just say it. So how do we work out how to um, uh, pinpoint that this particular act or um, omission has been done toward us on account of our race. Uh, in the case of D.H. Lawrence and others versus the Czech Republic, um, the court held that a better way of going around it would be to get statistics. And so to start with, I got some statistics that quite a lot of them out there, but most, a, a recent one uh, by the YouGov data on race at work survey 2018. It was complete, uh, completed by over 17,000 people uh, and it found at, as follows. One in four BME, that is black minority ethnic employees reported in 2018 that they had witnessed or experienced racist harassment or bullying from their manager in the last two years. There has been an increase in the proportion of people from the BME background who report they have witnessed or experienced racist harassment or bullying from customers or service users that is up uh, to 19% uh, from 16% in 2015. And only one in five employees surveyed uh, in 2018 said that 
their employers encourage them to call out bullying and harassing behaviors when they observe that. Now, what does the law say? The, the law doesn't really speak uniquely um, about um, harassment on their own or bullying on their own. It ties harassment to something uh, uh, that to stand as a head of claim, it must be that that harassing act is tied to a protected characteristic. And what is the protected characteristic? The Equality Act 2010 tells us that uh, protected characteristic comprise of race, uh, religion, belief or lack of belief, sex, age, sexual orientation, disability or gender reassignment. We will stick just by race because that is about what we are discussing today. For bullying, uh, the law doesn't really say anything expressly uh, as well. But however, there are, other, there are pieces of legislation that we can always get into to get help. You have the health and safety laws. You have the contract um, of employment, including contractual right to work in a safe environment and the implied duty of mutual trust and confidence. You have unfair dismissal laws. You have the Equality Act 2010, uh, laws protecting whistleblowers and laws of negligence, where the employer's duty to take reasonable steps to protect workers from foreseeable psychiatric injury caused by harassment and bullying. Uh, we have the Protection from Harassment Act 1997, uh, we have criminal law, including the laws um, outlawing malicious electronic uh, communications. Now, if we look at just a few of them, the health and safety at work. The health and safety at work 1974 requires employers to protect the health, including mental health and safety and welfare of their workers. And section two, sub one of that piece of legislation provides this in very, very strong firm, uh, firm positions. Section 2.2 as well um, um, makes it even stronger that protection from bullying and harassment is very important. Uh, you heard from previous speakers uh, and, and from uh, Mrs. Hombo that Talking across or over somebody could amount to a microaggression. And indeed, uh, that is correct. It also goes further that it may be um, harassment. And if that is the case, then you may contact your employers and raise it with them and actually tell them that if you do not do something, I will not come back to work. Uh, this was seen in the case of um, Harvest Press Limited versus McCaffrey in 1999, uh, where the gentleman was dismissed after he raised health and uh, safety concerns at work because his manager was always shouting on top of him when he was speaking, the manager cut across, right across and so on. So, he contacted um, management to say, listen, if you don't do anything about this, I will not come back to that work environment. The response to that was that he, he, he saw his P45 to the letter box. He issued proceedings in the employment tribunal and it was found that he has been dismissed unfairly. The employment um, uh, contract normally contains written terms which prohibit uh, harassment and bullying at work. But there are also implied terms in every contract of employment, whether it is, um, uh, it is written there or not, the law puts them in your contract of employment. And some of these would include not to breach the duty of mutual trust and confidence, not to harass or discriminate so I was talking about the implied terms in an employment contract um, um, and I said to act in good faith, not to exercise discretion or powers arbitrarily, 
to deal fairly with grievances and complaints, to take reasonable care of workers' health, including mental health. Employees have the right to work in a safe environment free from unwanted invasion of personal space and dignity. And if uh, an employer uh, or, or um, an organization is in breach of any of these terms, then the uh, employee or the worker could resign and make a claim for constructive unfair dismissal. Uh, but to do that, you must make sure, it must be clear that the employer have breached the fundamental term of the contract, uh, that you must have resigned um, in response to that breach and that the employee must not waive, you have, must not have waived this breach. In other words, you must not have ignored it for some time. In, in event that you do that, then it will be held that you know you had um, um, forgiven the employer and let things go as normal. Uh, but to resign and claim constructive unfair dismissal is a very risky thing, so you must seek legal advice before doing so. The next piece of legislation is the Equality Act uh, 2010, uh, and it sets out in section 26. Um, um, what harassment is all about. It talks about unwanted conduct and it talks about the purpose or effects of violating workers' dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. Now, these have already been elaborated or spoken about uh, by the previous speakers. So this is exactly what microaggression does, and it fits quite well within the definition of um, um, harassment under the Employment, uh, the Equalities Act 2010. Uh, the, the conduct must be unwanted. And a one-off generally, uh, will not cut the cake, it will not be sufficient just for a one-off um, uh, incident. It is um, uh, usually the case that when, some, when the microaggression starts, you, you tell the person, you, you bring it to their attention. So that in any event, if it is serious, a one-off could amount to um, harassment and um, uh, you could succeed if you were to make a claim. And the cases of um, uh, in situ cleaning versus heads and Williams versus Leeds Football Club give us authority for that. Now, um, uh, related to, this is where it gets a bit tricky because we can all easily pinpoint that this act or uh, omission towards us is hostile um, um, and it is microaggression. But what is it related to? Is it because of our race? Is it because of the color of, uh, color of our skin? Because if you don't show what it's related to, again, you will struggle. And um, um, in the uh, case of Bakali and Great Manchester buses, the court made it quite clear that any remark, comment, which is put in context would not necessarily fall to under harassment for the purposes of the uh, Equalities Act. So if somebody actually um, uh, made a comment to, um, to you in the grand scheme of things, so you are doing like um, uh, the test monkey survey and so on, and you're a black person sitting in the room and you don't pass your, 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 the questions, somebody could just say, well, you know, having a monkey is um, uh, uh, bright, uh, bright, smarter than you. Yes, using a monkey and a black person is very offensive and so on. But the person may turn around and say, well, I didn't say that, I didn't mean to, I, I wasn't saying that because of his race. I was just saying the monkey game that we we're playing, all of us, um, um, you know. So they'll always look at the context as a whole uh, to decide whether 
that particular act or omission amounts to um, uh, harassment for the purposes of the law. Now, trivial allegations are not protected. So if somebody makes a, a, a trivial thing and um, you take um, an issue about it, you may find that the, the, the law is not on your side. And this was um, uh, actually um, uh, confirmed in the case of Heafield versus Times Newspaper Limited 2013, where um, an employee just shouted across uh, a crowded room uh, and said, what is happening to the effing poop? Now, there was a Catholic Christian who felt offended by that and took an action um, against the, the, the company. And the tribunal found that, um, mm -hmm. uh, no, that was not um, harassment at all. Now, the fact that the harasser does not intend to create a hostile and degrading environment is irrelevant. It is how you, the recipient, you feel about it. And also um, uh, harassment, um, uh, it can be very, very serious and affecting people that are not aimed at. Uh, so you, you make your racist comments or your, your, your hostile comments and, and somebody that is not even geared towards them, is not even you know, directed towards them could get offended and they could um, make a claim and succeed under the act. Uh, the case that confirms it, the up-to-date case that confirms that position is Noble versus Seed Hill Limited 2016, where a white British worker brought uh, a claim successfully, uh, a harassment claim successfully because the employer, their employer failed to deal with a colleague, another white person who regularly made racist remarks. And victimization, victimization uh, is covered uh, under section 27 of the Equalities Act and it happens when you have raised complaints about you know, harassment, about discrimination and any of the protected acts. And as a result, your manager or other colleagues start picking on you um, at, uh, in your um, office or around the work environment. And this could just be things like being bullied or being belittled, ostracized or excluded, you know, having tasks removed from you denied promotion and all these things, all these will be, um, will be amount to, amounting to victimization. And you can still go back to the employment tribunal and say that, well, I'm being victimized because I did this uh, uh, and I, I, I brought a claim against the, the employer and, and they've start, since then uh, continued to victimize me. And just to um, uh, say that your claim for victimization will succeed even if your initial discrimination claim or complaint was unfounded, provided you did that in good faith. So uh, what do you do if you feel um, uh, our experience microaggression at work, which amounts to um, uh, harassment? Now, a lot has been said by that, uh, on that already by the previous speaker. So I'll just very, I'll skip very briefly. The first thing to do is check what the company uh, policies say on harassment and bullying. Keep that close to your chest at all times. Speak to a friend um, or a colleague because you may just find that they are also suffering the same thing from that one person. But above everything, that could become a vital witness to you if you decide to proceed to court. Speak to your manager and keep detailed record. Always keep detailed record of what is happening. If you're in a big organization with health and safety representative, talk to them. If you're a member of a trade union, speak to them. They'll give you free legal advice and um, uh, direct you towards um, a support group. Seek assistance from occupational health therapists through your employer. Initiate formal complaints and grievance procedure and seek mediation if that is offered. But it is not voluntary, you don't have to do it. If you are working in a big public authority um, um, organization, then the further uh, protection comes under section 149 sub 1, 
which places of that Equality Act, which places the local uh, the public authorities to do everything within their powers to eliminate discrimination, harassment, victimization, and other forms of protected um, uh, characteristics. If everything fails, you want to go to court, you want to go to the tribunal, there is no fee to pay. Uh, they, 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 they've just abolished the fee for employment tribunals. The time limit to issue proceedings is three months from the date of the act complained of, subject to going through the ACAS mandatory um, uh, early reconciliation, uh, reconciliation uh, program. Uh, compensation in the employment tribunal, well, generally they are not that big. Uh, average constructive unfair dismissal the year 2017 to 2018 was just about 8,000 pounds. And if you are making a claim for constructive unfair dismissal, uh, then you cannot claim for injury to feelings. By contrast, if you're claiming, making a claim for harassment uh, or victimization under the act, uh, compensation can include injury to feelings, uh, personal psychiatric injury, as well as aggravated damages. Compensation for feeling, uh, injury to feelings are uh, in three bands, uh, the lower band, the medium band, and the upper band. And uh, if, you, if you have the, 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 the bands to go through, you realize that this, the lower band starts from about 900 pounds to uh, 9,000 pounds. Not too serious. The middle band, not too uh, low, but not too high, about um, uh, 9,000 to 27,000 pounds. But you really have to get proper medical reports and documentation to show that you actually suffer, that the injury to your feelings actually affected you. So finally, I would say that um, um, the effect of microaggression can be very serious over time and has been described as death by a thousand cuts. So keep a good record of events uh, and, and conducts stating the dates, what was said, what was done, by whom, and how you felt, and what you did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baristan Kafu. And uh, this comes to the end of the presentations. I will say, the Q&A part of uh, the webinar has been very, very active and uh, we've had some fantastic support from behind the scenes. There are very few, in, uh, there are lots of interesting questions that I will try to summarize them. I think, Barista, I will, st I will start with you. I think uh, your presentation generated a lot of uh, interest from our attendees. You know. So the first question is, how do you substantiate unwanted behavior? Well, um, um, unwanted behavior is anything that you don't you don't want, uh, anything that you you don't you're not comfortable with. Uh, so, if someone says something to you and you don't um, approve of it, you don't like it, you don't feel good with it, you tell them that um, uh, don't do that again. Some people would be in. Um, um, some people would be used to certain environmental talks, discussions, and so on. You take the example of a case where you're in the building site, you're there with the boys on the um, scaffolding, and so on. They're used to doing certain things or using certain languages there. If you go to such a place and you want to work there, sometimes those languages you will hear. They swear, they do all sorts of things. But if you don't want it, you can always say, "Well, I don't like swearing. Don't swear at me," and so on. And if they carry on doing that then they're offending you. Right, now, um, another interesting question that came up in the, in the Q&A section is, uh, you talked of unfair dismissal. We know from what Mrs. Humbo said, you know, microaggression can lead to uh, an altered mental state. And that can also lead to absenteeism, and even people taking their own uh, resignation, like you mentioned. Now, where do we stand when people resign or they, 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 get, they get 
they, they're absent from work due to their mental state. And this leads to their mental state as a result of microaggression. And this leads to dismissal from their job. Okay, well, thank you, Doctor. When, I, when we talk about dismissal in, in the circumstance, you can either have um, um, constructive dismissal where you resign, the employee, the employee resigns and then goes to the tribunal and make a claim that I would not have resigned but for your conduct, but for the conduct of the employer. And you have the, the situation where the employer dismisses the employee because of absenteeism, because of the so because of the effect of the microaggression, the suffering. The case that I mentioned earlier of McCaffrey is a, a, a typical example where the gentleman said, well, the workplace is becoming hostile to me, management. If you don't do anything about it, I don't think I'll be able to come that in that office again. My boss keeps shouting at me. He swears, he, he stands behind me, watch me when I'm sitting on my computer. So I, I can't. If you don't do something about that, I cannot come. But what did the company do? They just sent his P45 to him and said, okay, we assume that you've resigned and goodbye. So, but he went to the employment tribunal and the employment tribunal said, no, you, 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 the, the, the company is wrong to dismiss you because sections 44 and section 100 of the Employment Rights Act 1996 clear, is clear, clearly labeled and it's out there that somebody must not suffer detriment because they raise issues of health and safety. At work. So if they raise an issue uh, 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 and as a result of that you dismiss them, then the dismissal is unfair. So that is one side of it. The other side is the one that you you resign after raising your, 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 your complaint and the, the, the company is doing nothing about it. You can resign and claim constructive unfair dismissal. But to do that, you have to think about it very, very carefully because constructive unfair dismissal can be very tricky. Now, uh, Barista, Barista let, me, let, let, let me just clarify the question. The, quest, the, the, the question is, somebody as a result of microaggression tends not to, not to go to work, so that's absenteeism. And as a consequence of absenteeism, because of microaggression, the person gets dismissed from the job. Will that be considered unfair dismissal? Well, uh, it could be. Um, I think if somebody's staying away from uh, work as a result of the effect of uh, microaggression, it means that sickness is coming in as well. So they are already feeling distress, anxiety, and all the sort of things. It may be a case where the, the sickness policy of the company will be followed. Because as I said, they... Uh, microaggression is something that, you know, it is generally difficult to, to, to succeed in tribunals if it is not tied to a protected characteristics. So it must show that the microaggression first is um, as a result, the person doing that to you is doing that on account of your race or your sexuality or your, your, your religion. But if you're feeling bad, and I go back to the case that I gave ex example, if you feel harassed, stressed by the fact that the microaggression is going on and your, your organization is not helping you, then you can stay home uh, and, and say, well, I'm not coming until you do something about it. It will be within your right. And if they dismiss you on that uh, account, then that will be unfair dismissal. If you just decide to say, okay, well, that is microaggression and I'm not coming to, and you cannot actually show you know, that, you know, it is something really serious to be able to, 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 to make an, a reasonable person or an average person not come to work, then you may find that uh, you, you, they will in, initiate disciplinary against you. You've heard that microaggression is subtle. It is, and, and the offenders generally don't say, well, we're doing this because you are black, we're doing this because you're this. They, they just do it in a subtle way. And the employment tribunal generally they will look into these things carefully to see whether is it really something worth somebody resigning. If they had given, if they had attended an apology, why did they resign or why are they not going back to work? So um, um, it's a very uh, uh, careful area to 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 walk around. 
Thanks. Thank you very much, Barista. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Humble, I, I think you, your, your talk attracted some attention. And the first question that was mentioned is, uh, do we have any pointers where people can seek help when their mental health is impacted upon by microaggression? Thank you, Dr. Ngachu. Um, yes, we do. But I'll just elaborate a little bit further. I think let's just remember that this is subtle and it's very difficult to prove. And this is happening. We're talking about microaggression at workplace. Most, if you work in the NHS, most NHS organizations or trusts would have, of course, every organization have employment relations, so HR. Most NHS organizations are also expected to have what we call cultural ambassadors or speak up guidance. So if you can't speak to your manager or your manager's manager, then there are people that you can talk to. You could hear Barista Kafu already say there are unions. So most hospitals or most trusts would have unions and your own various, um, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or an OT, you've got your own regulatory bodies that would support you. But in terms of the general rule of thumb, once you're feeling that you're perceiving that you're being harassed for one reason or the other, it's good to talk to somebody. If you cannot talk to your boss, speak to somebody else. There are people in the trust that can help you. If you cannot do that, please contact your human resource department and they'll give you some advice. There's counseling that is available. Again, there are local self-help groups and national groups, i.e. if you're feeling low, if you're feeling suicidal, there are groups like Samaritans, if alcohol related or substance misuse problems, you've got AA, your GP would be of real benefit. So please speak to someone. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Now, let, 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 let me anchor another question to what you've just said. You know, now, this, this came from the Q&A, interesting question. How do you deal with microaggression when the perpetrator is your supervisor? So how do you do with uh, microaggression when the perpetrator is your supervisor? So if, if you hear what are the, just the, my previous answer, it's very difficult to confront the person who is the perpetrator and you are their sort of junior or subordinate, put it that way. Now, it is an expectation, particularly in all, I don't know about the private organization, but in all NHS organization, in all care and social care providers, it is an expectation that you have pick up guidance. And these are people that will do things on your behalf, that will encourage you, that will support you without the trust knowing your identity and they are well publicized. Each organization also would have ethnic minority, you know, so leads from ethnic minority background and each organization would have that network. So those are the, your contacts, those are the people that you can speak to if you don't want to speak directly to your manager or your senior who is the, um, for a better word, User. Thank you. Now the plot thickens, Rose. Theodore. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just want to add that usually when things like that happen, which is your manager, it's better to use the complaint procedure in the uh, that you have in the trust or where you are, so that that could be investigated. And, and, and because with your manager. And if you're not happy with that, then you go on top of that, you make an appeal when they make a decision. But then if it goes against you, or but you make that first. And if it happens again, you continue the same thing. And as uh, Barista Nkafu said, and actually you need proof because if that happens several times and you're making complaints and then it's not addressed, that would be the proof that when you go to see somebody like 
uh, Barista um, Kafo, they will say, well, he's been to you guys and you've not addressed it. Now, like I was saying, that the plot thickens in the sense that you, you are a genius staff and you feel, you feel that you are, you, you, you feel that you are, you are being uh, harassed, I'll put it that way, or you are, you are suffering from microaggression within your environment and your senior is somebody of a similar race. So I will say another ethnic minority is your senior, but apparently is sitting quiet on the issue despite being aware of it. How do you deal with that? Oh, take, if I could take the um, question, um, I think, how do you deal with it? Again, it's simple. Again, I think one of the key issues is that not everybody can speak up. So uh, most of us who are seniors in the organization that we work, we're very few as Blacks. So that's the honest truth, particularly in the NHS. It is quite difficult to have the lonely voice. But as, I mean, again, as I say, each organization should have a network. So it's an expectation from the government, from NHS England. Each organization should have ethnic minority network. And there is a lead in that network. Those are the people that you can speak up to. Don't forget, each organization also then have union reps. And you all also have your own individual union reps that depending on whether you belong to RCN or Unite or Unison. So those are the people that you can speak to if you feel that your bosses or colleagues like yourself who are Blacks are not listening. Or if you feel that you can't speak up. Um, I think the key is you need to sort where the support is because support is really available. Um, you need to have a voice and there are people around you that would support you, not necessarily mean your bosses or people from the same ethnic minority. There are groups that will support you and you just need to know how to get in, make contact with them. And if in doubt, please, be, you know, if, if you're not in any union, i.e. UNICEN, i.e. RUCN, or um, GMC, you should ask a healthcare professional or a social, a health, social care professional. You should belong to those professions. They do help. Um, thank you. Right. Thanks very much, Mrs. Humbo. Now, let, let, let's, let's turn our attention to an area where we hardly talk about when we talk about the workplace. There was a question from the uh, from the audience. Um, how do you deal with microaggression as a student when the perpetrator is your lecturer? Dr. Nkwayep, do you think you'll be able to give us an answer here? So, well, I, I think a lot of students have this type of thing. And as um, uh, Mrs. Humble mentioned, some people will not be able to talk about it. Uh, most of most of the time, uh, people would student in, in particular will have difficulties because they are afraid of being punished in a way, one way or another, and 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 so they they, they stay in silence about it. But I think even in the university, you have procedures there, and you have where you could make complaints because one of the things that I mentioned earlier is was have the facts right. Be calm about it. Make the make the professor to repeat the offence or the alleged offence, uh, and, and so before you you actually act on it. And my my view is, I think there's student union where you could approach, uh, and and I think you could go through to them and then talk because you may not be the only one. It may be that he's doing it for all minority or marginalized group. And, and so, and then there will be, I think, a complaint procedure at the university whereby you could actually launch a complaint when you've gathered all the facts right and so on. And if you've talked to the union and the other student of your ethnicity, then to see whether it's not only you 
but it's going to several uh, uh, others. And you could make a group type of complaint against him, which then would be looked into by a different person and then probably then give you, you guys an answer. That would be the only way. So sometimes students would just stay and not do nothing, let it go. But uh, most of the time, if we let it go, then it means that uh, this, the perpetrator would continue doing what they've been doing for years and years because nobody actually stood uh, and, and, and so on. So somebody has to stand and then make a complaint about it. Thank you. Right, Dr. Mpafe, another, another question directed uh, in coming in your direction. This was a question in the panel which I summarized as such. Yeah. How different is microaggression from racism or is microaggression a subset of racism? I, I think uh, Barista uh, Julius Kafu will probably deny that I wouldn't mix the two. But actually, microaggression is a covert way of racism. That's what I would actually say. It's a covert racism. And, and, and it's, it's actually, because it's difficult to, to, to actually pinpoint what was going on. Uh, or, so, because it could be, I said in one of the history that this type of communication typically appear harmless to the observer, but they have detrimental effect on the, 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 the recipient. And they are considered, uh, to, 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 to tell you the truth, a form of covert racism or everyday type of discrimination. And when I was talking about um, micro insult, it is very difficult to, to, to actually say, to actually say, well, is, is it racism? Is it not racism? But that's actually the thing that give the, that have the major impact on, on Blacks. And because since we're born, we receive it daily. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure people listening would know that it's very difficult sometimes to say that the person was actually biased or discriminating, whereas that's what is actually going on. Thank you. Baris Kafu. do you have anything to add to that? Yes, just to say that uh, uh, going to the previous um, uh, point before this one, the, the idea of if you're immediate boss, uh, your manager is um, uh, somebody from the same um, ethnic background. I think the law is, um, uh, you know, aware of tokenism, where you get one black person or one person of uh, race and put somewhere, and then the other people actually run the show are not from that race and they decide. And so you see the, the person of your race, they are there, they are helpless. They may be going through the same thing, but they want to show that as they are your boss, and sometimes for various reasons, they tend to sometimes overtly support the aggressors because they want to keep their jobs, they want to maintain high position. So they actually use them to punish the, the, the other people. And you, you'll find that most of those sort of people, they will not turn up as witnesses. So it doesn't matter you know, what happens, they won't turn up because they're not interested in you, they're interested in protecting their, their positions and their jobs. Now, coming to the difference between um, uh, micro um, aggression and race discrimination, I think it is almost one and the same thing in a way. They, they are all they, they, they interchange. You can use them sometimes to change. That's why in my presentation, I mentioned harassment, victimization, discrimination, but I was fo focusing only on harassment. See, the law on race discrimination used to be really, really complicated. Uh, in, in, in terms of proving whether something was raised um, uh, 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 discrimination, because you, you have to show that somebody was hostile against you or somebody did something really bad to you and that you believe that that, uh, that, that action was on the account of your race. So it was very difficult. I mean, the tribunal will always find that, yes, there was hostility, but we don't believe it was on your race. Uh, it was on, on account of your race. But now it has moved on a bit to say that once you establish a fact, premier facia, that the tribunal can see 
that there has been hostility and you are saying that that hostility is on account of your race, then the owners shift to the employer to show that no, it was not because of your race. Then what happens in court, you will find the employer coming with six witnesses or how many witnesses they want to come with, half of them black people or people of your race, and they sit in the witness box and tell you how fantastic the organization is when it comes to race relations. In fact, how the way they treat you um, as, you know, the witness will be saying how you know, they're very happy there, everything is fine. And uh, that, well, that person complaining, well, well, she normally would complain that way, wouldn't she? Because sometimes she, when she comes, that's what even happens when she comes late to work and you ask her and then she will. So they'll actually bring uh, witnesses from your own racial background to come and, you know, so it, it, it gets uh, uh, tricky in, in the circumstance. But when you have a good and clear case of race discrimination, it is going to, it is most likely to succeed. But may I just say very quickly that about 95% of race cases fail. And uh, the, most of the reason, most of the time, the reason is because even though the tribunal will find hostility, but they will not find that it was on account of your, of your race. Right, thank you very much. Let me see if we have any other burning question uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, hello. Yes, Dr. Kwaib. Yeah, I, I was going to, to, to ask uh, Dr. Um, about Barista Kafu. I think when we say microaggression, if it wasn't for Lord McPherson, we would never have known that the microaggression that the police were doing was racist. And which might only when uh, Lord McPherson look into what the daily activity of the police towards a uh, black, that it, it transpired that there is actually, it was an institution that was racist. So I, I, I think, that's why it is believed when we look at all microaggression, it's a covert way of, being, of, of, of racism, even in the workplace, though it's probably, we can't demonstrate it as uh, with uh, Barista Kafu would say. Yeah, well, I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, McPherson um, made those recommendations. It's quite clear that there are institutions that are flouting the law by the day. Uh, the police have been known and said by uh, um, Lord McPherson, Sir McPherson, uh, that they're institutionally racist. Recently, we've heard about the case of BBC, how they, they, you know, they've had a history of paying male staff more than female staff. And you have this in all in institutions all over, and they have been dragged to court from, from, from time to time. And every now, the police, the institutional um, uh, racism has still not been eradicated because one of the recommendations of um, Sir McPherson, recommendation 61, was that every time someone is stopped and asked to account of their movement, they should be given um, uh, a report, a written report, a written note for that. But up to today, the police are not doing that. So it is, you know, every, you know they are not doing it. And despite the fact that people have pushed and pushed and pushed, they're not doing it. So does it, you still get more black people stopped and searched. You still, you know, you still get more young black people flaunting the, the, the um, um, justice system in this country. I mean, there are courts in, this, in, 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 in England where if you're coming from a particular racial group and you appear that your chances of going to prison is almost three times higher than if you are a white person. So all these things are still there and all these are institutions that we, we live in. So some of them are clear, but some of them you cannot, you know, you cannot distinguish. You cannot say this is because of this person's race. Because as I said in my opening remark, it is difficult because when they, the person taking the decision to either send somebody to prison or take the decision to stop and search somebody, they will not say, oh, sorry, sir, I'm stopping you because you're a black person. They don't say that, you know, so, uh, and that's why when you go to court, they would, you know, they, there's always the, the case that, well, this officer stops everybody. He stops pink, white, and so on. So there's nothing to show that stopping you um, uh, was because of your race. And that is why, again, I started my presentation by using statistics. So these are the, some of the helpful things that 
you can say to the tribunal, but look, just by, you know, to give you a flavor, look at what happened. One in four uh, people, black people have, so it is likely that this would have been part of that statistic and so on. That is how you do to actually make successful discrimination cases. But as I say, most of them are not, um, uh, unfortunately, most of them don't succeed. Thank you, Boris Tenkafu. Um, Dr. Mpafe, you did, you did mention environmental microaggression. Yes. And you mentioned posting posters yes. with black people to represent immigrants. Illegal immigrants. Illegal, illegal immigrants, sorry. Yeah. If, 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 you, if you do that, actually, it implies that if you have a poster like that, it implies that black are always illegal immigrants. That's what it implies. Would you and, classify and, that as racism? Well, that's actually, it's, 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 why would you do that in the first place? That's what you say. It's an it's a environmental microaggression, which is a covert type of racism, as, 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 as I mentioned before. Yes, it would be. That's why you have certain, um, in, in, in England, when you do certain advert, they tell you straight away that you have to stop because it implies that you're, you're doing certain implication. And that's why they ask some people will have to stop. Usually, for the, I'll give you an example that happened uh, recently. If you remember during the election in, in, in America, they put a Jew with slightly a long nose. That's, that's a picture, that's the, it was a poster. That become, it, it become, it, it, and they had to take it down and apologize for it. And, and it's things like that. Oh, and, and I was also mentioning in the 60s, for example, black actors, you didn't have any black actors, but you have a lot of black people playing roles, but they were all white. That also in effect was microaggression, but that's a, a, an environmental one, but because you're not get, getting jobs for the black people, but you're giving it to the white. Now, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mpafe. Thank you very much, panelists. I think we have no more questions in the Q&A section to answer. I would like to advise you to read the article, The Color of Free Ride, is published in the Economic Journal by a researcher from the Warwick Business School. And the interesting finding from that publication is that you black people, you always get the wrong end of the stick. So when you ask for favors, you are the last people to get a favor. White people get more favors than blacks and black people get less favors even from other black people. Thank you guys. I, know, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you. We're still on, on, on live, I think, on Facebook. Yes, we are. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Great job, panelists.